July 22nd, um, Dave Waite, uh, who owns Land Home Financial, they just got new space downstairs and they have uh, room for about 50. So um, we're, we're shooting to do this July 22nd, which is a Saturday. And notes are cool because you can be an, you know, an active uh, participant or just purely passive. And, and so if you have like a retirement account, you might want to self-direct and start purchasing notes and things and that. So just kind of open up your mind to some other opportunities that are out there. And uh, without further ado, we'll give, turn it over to you, Richard, and um, take some notes. Cool. So do we have a clicker? Now I ask him. <laughs> okay, while he's looking for that. So I had my own commercial uh, mortgage banking company uh, for about 20 years. We lent nationwide and we sold that. And then I um, invested in senior housing for um, about six or seven years. And then I did 18 flips after that, mostly locally here. And I'm currently a loan officer for, for Land Home. Does this work? Okay. So, uh, as Bo mentioned, I've been through the Note School Academy and continue to work with them and investing in notes nationwide. Bo asked me to, since Note School is going to come to the Bay Area, they'll be here August four, five, six for a three day class. <clears throat> They're also going to offer this one day Saturday class. Um, he asked me to give you guys just a, just a very little quick snippet um, of what a seller carryback might look like. And uh, so I did a deal, or I uh, did an example for one uh, on a project that he gave me the numbers on it that he's looking at in uh, North Bend, Indiana. So um, this is a very small example of what you can do. So if we take this, um, project that he gave me. He's buying it for 15. He says he's going to put 50 or 10 into it. So his total investment is going to be 25. I'm just trying to establish what we're dealing with here. So he's going to sell it for 45. And just so we all know, the market rents in the market are $850. So one of the things you'll find out when you get into notes is that there are so many options, you go, ah, what do I, what do I do? You know, do I offer uh, financing with 10% uh, down or 20% down or do I carry back all the um, uh, profit or what do I do? I mean, there's so many options. It's kind of tough to decide when you're getting started. So I think Bo originally wanted me to run this example and say, well, gee, Richard, what would it be like with 10% down or to the, to the buyer? And in other words, if you had a California buyer go into the market and buy it, what sort of yield would he get? And I ran the numbers, and honestly, they were so outrageously good for the investor, he was getting like a 38% return. I said, Bo's not going to want to do that. None of us would want to do that to give uh, that type of return to somebody. Well, then I ran it with 20% down, and it was still much better for the seller than it needed to be. In other words, I could get a much better deal for Bo. So you know, at Note School, they typically talk about a 50-50 deal, which is if a price is $45,000, you do a mortgage for $22,500. Uh, in this case, Bo's got $25,000. So it didn't quite get him to the twenty five. dollars What I was trying to do was cash him out. Um, so I did it as a fifty-five forty-five. dollars It's an odd number, but that's part of what you realize you can get when you um, do these deals in that you by that I mean you can tailor them any way you want you can tailor them for yield you can tailor them for being out of the deal you can tailor them for a self-directed IRA where you're getting long-term cash flow um, you can sell a partial in the note um, any number of things so uh, in this case I thought well the best deal for Bo is if he just gets out completely so let's see how that works. So he's got a, selling it for a purchase price of $45,000. He's got 25 in it, and he's gonna create a note for $20,000. So if he gives his buyer um, that note at 12%, uh, the payments are gonna be um, $665 a month, and that's a three-year note. 
got taxes of $454 plus $200 per year hazard insurance. So the all-in PITI is $719 a month. This is to the buyer, okay? So Mr. Buyer can get $850 a month. So he says, well, hmm, all right, I'm not getting a fantastic yield on there, but uh, I'm making a little bit of money. So the net rent per year is $1,572, and I'll just get, let you know up front that he has a return on investment of only 6.28%. So why would somebody, you guys tell me, if you're only getting, if the investor's only getting a 6.28%, why would he possibly want to do this deal? I'm sorry? No, he's, this, is, this is Mr. California buyer, and he's buying the property at, for a full price at $45,000. Sorry? No, uh, Bo, Bo has pulled his cash out, but this is the buyer. This is the, bu this is the buyer, buyer's perspective. Okay, so again, you have to sort of look at these from a, lo from a lot of different ways. If I'm the buyer, the California buyer, I'm saying, well, gee, I'm only making 6.28%, but guess what? My rent is totally covered, or my, my PITI is totally covered by my rent. Matter of fact, I'm making a little bit of money, and I'm out of this deal in three years. I have no basis. So I'm going to be making $850 a month for as long as I want to hold this property after that with nothing in the deal. That's a good deal for any investor. You know? So you could tailor this other, other ways, but that's still a very good, a good deal for anybody who wants to invest. So uh, why would Bo want out of it? Why would Bo want to do this? Why wouldn't he want to just take his profit and say, thanks you very much? Well, again, it depends on what his objective is. Okay? If he wants to take all his money up front and roll it into another deal, then he shouldn't sell a note. But if he wants to put some of this money into a long-term uh, IRA, self-directed IRA, or something which is an excellent vehicle, which we can talk about, and maybe Mike's going to talk about a little bit, um, then uh, these are great uh, ways to get tax-free income. So typically what you do is, is you'd have a longer term note. This one pays off in three years, which is because it was a good deal. But typically you try to get like maybe a 10-year deal. And you sell, what's called, you sell what's called a partial, which is just a piece of that loan. So maybe you sell five years of that income stream, or maybe you sell four years, or whatever works for you and your criteria. In this case, I chose to cash Bo out, so he's got nothing in the deal. He's totally out. He's put 25 in, and he got 25 back, and he gave um, his buyer a $20,000 note. He's going to sell um, 24 months of that note. And if you look at the present value at 8%, now who's going to buy it at 8%? Well, there are a lot of very passive investors with self-directed IRAs that are very willing to do a deal at 8% for two years. They say, thank you very much. And this is a, a nice little starter deal for somebody, honestly, um, because they can buy it for $14,703. And they will get an, eight, an income stream of 8% for 24 months. Bo gets that $14,000. So he's taken all of his money out of the deal, and he gets $14,000, and he's still got 12 months of what's called the tail um, at that, um, on that note. So he's got an income stream of $665 for one year. Now, in this instance, that's not very long. Um, usually, as I said, you try and get a longer term, but that's the basis of what we're doing here and what you can, what you can do with notes. So if you think that this type of thing interests you at all, the note school class is only 49 bucks, nine to five and one of the guys is gonna fly in, they're based in Dallas, and then they've got a three-day class after that. They've got tons of webinars, you can learn a lot more other than what I said um, by um, just watching the webinars, go to noteschool.com and sign up and they'll start feeding you all sorts of um, good information. And hopefully if um, Bo agrees, um, I'll give you a couple actual longer presentations at some of the time, so thanks. You have questions? Anybody? You want to? No. Okay. okay. So uh, whoever wants to go to that, 
let Cynthia know. That's Cynthia over there. She didn't introduce herself. But um, we need at least 20 people to go. It's going to be on Saturday, July 22nd. Lunch will be provided. And anyway, so let her know. Um, I'm going to let Michael get started right away because uh, he's got a lot of good, great, awesome information to share with us. Um, I, I'm sure most of you know Michael, but uh, he doesn't really need an introduction because he's, he's part of the family here. Okay, thank you, Bo. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah. As uh, we're going to touch on a couple of things tonight, I think you'll see some note discussion too, some overtones. Anyway, this is going to be our discussion tonight. We're going to talk about growing capital and mitigating taxes. And depending on what you're involved in in real estate, uh, taxation is a big, big chunk of your, you know, your profits of what you earn. So, uh, who would like to pay less and earn more, keep more of what they earn? Everybody's hands should go up. Uh, whether you're buying, selling, optioning, exchanging, wholesaling, if you can learn to work with financial friends or allies, uh, the benefits and the rewards can be beneficial to both parties. And that's what we're going to touch on tonight. Uh, this is my contact information for those of you that don't know me. Um, I am with a company called Sunvest Property Solutions. And uh, we have an active buy-sell business. Uh, here in the Bay Area. We primarily focus in four counties and most of the municipalities within those four counties. Uh, Marin County, Napa County, Sonoma County, and Solano County. Um, so we, we're always looking for properties in those regions and any of those areas that may be within those counties. Uh, we actually have a few projects going on right now, one in Napa off of uh, Silverado and Hagen. Uh, a Fairfield house that just came on the market that we just finished transforming and then we have a Vallejo house which unfortunately had a fire next door to it about two weeks ago um, in which the garage burned down and caused damage to the house but we have insurance so that's good uh, anyway that's my contact information as Bo mentioned also I run the Bay Area Wealth Builders Association if you want some more information on the meetings that we put on uh, you can write down our website I don't think I have a slide with it on here but it's B A W B dot info so it is a dot info extension at the end b a w b dot info okay uh, we're going to talk also before we get into the meat of it tonight about the four pillars of enhancing yourself learning and moving forward because there's a lot of moving parts to this business uh, there's a lot of education involved some of you I heard say earlier that that's what you're here for you're trying to to uh, uh, bolster up your education and by the way education is uh, learning from people that are in the trenches that are also sharing not only their good experiences but their war stories of things that didn't work out is very very important as well um, because it doesn't always work out I can tell you from our experience so education information knowledge wisdom all of these things are very, very important and fundamental, if you will, if you want to be in this business long term. But what is not, what are you not seeing up there right now? I heard somebody say it. You got to take action. You can, you know, go to these classes, you can stick courses up on your shelf and not do anything with them. And we see so many people do that year after year after year. They never write offers, they never take any action, and they wonder why they're not doing any business. You really do need to take action. Don't try to get it perfect, but do take that next step. <clears throat> so um, this is a cool little slang, I think, that makes a lot of sense. It's from Benjamin Franklin. He talks about an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. Who would agree with that? OK, good. Excellent. I, I, I think it's a great slogan. This is a class that I teach. I put on some classes uh, every once in a while, usually once a year. I don't know if anybody's in this room who's taken my class. It's called the Crush It class, but it's a wonderful overview of marketing, finding deals, negotiating deals, the special contract that we use that's only four pages long that's written in layman's terms so that even a civilian can understand it, and, um, and how we interact with uh, the sellers and get them to move forward and so on and so forth. So um, uh, we'll let you know when that class is. We haven't set the schedule yet. It'll probably be sometime in 2018, the first quarter, that I'll do it. I only do it once a year, and uh, it's usually evolving, too. It's not just a, a static class. It changes as the market changes as well. Um, I want to talk a little bit about tonight about an event that we have coming up, uh, and Bo will give you some more information on this as well. But has anybody heard of Peter Fortunato and John Schaub? Okay, a few of you have. Okay. Has anybody had the pleasure of listening and learning from them? Okay. 
Um, I don't endorse a lot of speakers and educators, but I will tell you that Peter and John are two people that you do not want to miss, especially when they're coming to town and are going to be local and you can catch them. Uh, being able to learn from one of them was fabulous, and the two of them together is just tremendous. Uh, they've been at this game a long, long time. They've been through many, many, many cycles. As I mentioned earlier, you want to learn from people who are in the trenches, in combat, and these guys are in the trenches and in combat on a regular basis. Um, they're going to talk about some of the things that they see on the horizon. If you'll notice, the topic of the discussion is busts, booms, and beyond. And what's after the word beyond? There's a big question mark there, isn't there? Because a lot of people, I think, right now in the market that we're in are asking themselves, where are we right now? And is this market going to evolve and change anytime soon? <clears throat> and I think that's a big concern. I know it's a big concern for me. Uh, I thought it would, change, it would have changed by now, and it's continued to run on. Uh, I will say this to you, and, and we'll get into some more slides on this in a few moments, but uh, it will change. Just as the sun rises in the east, there will be a change coming. I just don't know exactly when that change is going to happen. But anyway, this two-day class is going to be fabulous. Uh, with the two of these guys interacting together. It'll be held at the South San Francisco Conference Center down near SFO Airport. Uh, we will have people coming to this class from all over the United States and very heavy on Southern California and the Western States. The networking will be phenomenal. Uh, the interaction with John and Peter, they're very accessible. They love to take questions. Uh, they will stay Saturday night and do a special Q&A session on anything real estate related. And to me, that's a real treat just to be able to listen in the room to what they have to say during that time. But uh, they're tremendous individuals. I really put them at a different level than most folks that are in the real estate education game. And I do hope you'll consider coming to the class and taking advantage of their visit here because I think it'll be well worth your while. Um, this is one way to register for the class. Uh, we ha I think we have, there's a special URL to, for you to look at, and I think Bo may have some flyers or something he's going to give you as well uh, also. But uh, we do give you a discount if you pre-register early, and we hope you'll take advantage of that. And uh, some people, if you want to get lodging down near that airport so you don't have to schlep down there every day, Book your room now because we have a limited block of rooms available uh, right next to the conference center, and that expires about a month before the event. Anyway, this is going to be a dynamite event. We do hope you'll consider joining us. So we talked earlier about where is this market heading. And I'm not here to, uh, to provide you know, a, a prediction because I'm not an economist. I will tell you, as I said earlier, I know there will be a change happening at some point. Uh, I kind of think it's maybe within the next 12 months or so, but I've been wrong before. Um, but I do not think these prices are going to be continually sustainable long term. And uh, something's going to give, and it's going to give at some point. Now, again, the big question mark is, you know, is, what is that when question? When is that going to happen? So um, you can see that through some of these cycles in the past, you know, we've, we've reached some crazy highs. And uh, if we had a 50% drop, and that's what we kind of went through recently in some parts of the Bay Area back in 2006, 2007, on, on over, that's a pretty dramatic drop. Um, I don't know that we'll move into that again, because that was kind of a driven by all those crazy loans and the credit freeze and things of that nature. But um, you know, even if it's a 20% drop, that's pretty significant, given the price levels that we're at right, at right now. Um, one good thing about the Trump administration, whether you like him, dislike him, disagree or agree with him, is that uh, he's good for business, according to a lot of the, uh, these particular people. Um, the cartoonists, the comedians, and Saturday Night Live seem to love him. Uh, they love him apparently very, very much. <clears throat> now, why do I think that the market will change at some point? Well, there's been some change in monetary policy. As you know, rates have been moving. They've been moving and inching up. The economy's been heating up, and uh, if you think of that interest rate movement as sort of putting the uh, governor on a go-kart to slow it down a little bit, that's sort of, I think, what the end result is going to be with the Fed policy, is that they're trying to keep this economy from overheating, and uh, these interest rate increases, I think, are going to have some effect, maybe not immediately, but certainly down the road a little bit. Now, has anybody been following the stock market recently? We just keep reaching new highs, new records, and it just seems crazy. And I think that's also ripe for some kind of a correction at some future point, Pro probably not too far around the corner. 
One thing about interest rates rising, though, is that you, as a borrower, lose purchasing power. Um, it's been said that for every 1%, every 100, ba 100 basis points increase in interest rates, I'll move, I'll, I'll move over from side to side. Every 100% increase in uh, basis points and in, in interest rates, you end up being able to afford to purchase 11, about 11% 11 less home. So uh, if rates continue to escalate up, that is going to have an effect on values, or at least borrowers' ability to buy, and, uh, and you will see that take hold. So let me ask you a question. When was the last time we had a major overhaul in the federal tax code? Anybody? Never. never. <laughs> Somebody says never. Uh, no, we did have one. It's been a while, though. 72, 82. Well, let me give you the answer. About 31 years ago, when Ronald Reagan was in office, Tax Reform Act of 1986. Now, since that time, if you include Reagan, has, first of all, has a lot changed in 31 years? I mean, I don't think the internet was even around back then. Uh, I know smartphones weren't around, um, uh, I, uh, for sure. Um, let's see, what else has changed in 31 years? A lot. Um, but um, we've had actually six administrations that have come and gone uh, in the White House. Can anybody name those six? Quickly? You don't prefer not to. Okay, uh, should I help you? Okay. Reagan, Bush the Elder. Who was after Bush the Elder? Clinton, Bush the Younger. Then Obama, right? And now Trump. Yeah, there, there's your six. So six administrations have come and gone uh, since the uh, last time we had tax reform, major tax reform in the federal tax code. And as I said, a lot has changed in those 31 years. As a matter of fact, the federal tax code, the regulations associated with the tax code has mushroomed and grown to over 80,000 pages. Now, just to give you a perspective of what that is, here's the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obama, Obamacare. Um, the actual, this is an actual picture. My, my daughter works in D.C. She works at the White House, actually. And um, this is in the Capitol building. They had a, this is the law, which is about 2,700 pages. These are the regulations, which is about 22,000 pages. And they had this on display as the, all of this was unfolding and, and, the, and the bill was coming into effect. So that's just one bill. That's the Affordable Care Act. Here's the tax code regulations, with John Boehner standing next to the uh, roughly 80,000 pages of regulations. Um, do you think the tax code maybe could be simplified just a bit? I would hope so. Yeah, that would be a way to do it. So I want to ask you this. Is there a connection, or who believes there's a connection between politics and business, and real estate for that matter? I think there's a clear connection. And what I'm trying to point out to you, of course, is that with tax overhaul in the works right now, and there's a lot of discussion going on about it, you're just starting to hear it, there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers. There always is. They can never agree, you know, Congress on, uh, you know, the lobby lobbyists are heavy and, and pushing, you know, their agenda, and there definitely will be winners and losers just as there was in 1986. So let me ask you about depreciation. If you own rental real estate, who knows what depreciation is? Can you want to care to give me a quick summary in your words? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but it just. Okay. Okay. He, the improvements. Yeah. Okay. So he says the building or the improvements he can write down. It's as if the government's giving you some kind of a a credit almost, if you will, or a loss for wear and tear. Well, let's look at the actual definitions. One of the many benefits of owning real estate is that you can depreciate, which is the loss in value of the building over time, due to wear and tear and, de and de deterioration in age. Now, if it's a well-constructed building or property, usually they don't deteriorate too much. Uh, so it really is kind of a tax benefit that the government is giving us to invest in real estate and, own, and provide rental real estate. Does anybody remember what ACRS stood for? I know we have a few people that are puzzled by that acronym. Okay, um, ACRS was considered the Accelerated Cost Recovery System. 
Um, this is now we're, go, we're we're taking a trip back in memory lane here to 1980, the 1980s, and it used to be that there was a depreciation method that allowed you to assign assets periods of cost recovery based on specific IRS criteria. It used to be under the accelerated method that that was 15 years. So rather than 27 and a half years, which is where it is now, the government allowed us to accelerate depreciation over a 15 year period of time. And under ACRS, you could write off passive losses generated from real estate investments against virtually all income. Can you do that right now? Not really. So that was a very uh, interesting tax policy, if you will, uh, that was under ACRS. Um, ACRS, of course, was changed in the 1986 tax reform. And they then went to what's called the modified accelerated system, which now, as you, you mentioned, it allows us to depreciate residential buildings over 27 and a half years and commercial structures over 39 years uh, based on so-called useful life. Now, when you depreciate a property, can you depreciate the dirt or the land that it sits on? No, you can't. Uh, it's only the improvements. That's all the IRS gives you. So, uh, as a result of that 1986 Tax Reform Act, they established, which is still with us today, what I call the three bucket system, if you will, of how income is taxed. And some of you may have heard this from your accountant, or maybe you've been to a workshop or a seminar on this, but let's just go over it very quickly. Uh, we have what's called the active income bucket, okay? The active income bucket is depending on the amount of income, the federal government taxes ordinary income up from 33% up to potentially 39% plus, and passive income around 15%. Active income is earned income for services that have been performed. This includes wages, tips, salaries, commissions, short-term gains from income from businesses, and which is a material participation. Active income means you're doing something in order to receive that income, some kind of work, some kind of effort. You are not hands-off. If you're in the fix and flip business, who's doing fix and flips or renovations? Who's doing any wholesaling of property? That's active income based on the efforts that you're involved in. It's highly taxable, okay? But that's one of the forms of income that exists under our current system. The other type of income bucket is the passive income bucket. Earnings in individuals derived from rental property, limited partnerships, or other enterprises in which he or she is not materially involved. As with non-passive income, passive income usually is taxable. However, it's treated differently by the IRS. Uh, typical passive income is from rents, income from trade or business that you're not materially involved in. And I think royalties also fall into that category as well. Uh, that would be considered passive income. Now remember I said earlier that passive income, I'm sorry, passive losses prior to 1986 could be used to offset all active income. And again, if you go back in memory lane a little bit, what was happening back in the early 80s is a lot of limited partnerships were being set up and these different real estate structures which did nothing but produce losses. And people would invest in those partnerships just for the losses, not for the economic benefits. Why? Because they could use those losses to offset other active income. And again, that loophole was closed in 1986 uh, until today. Oh. Okay, so anyway, uh, passive income, as I said, you know, I mean, passive losses at that time could be offset against other income. And, uh, and you saw a lot of these, these wealthy, high wage earners investing in these partnerships just for the tax benefits only. They weren't really producing any income, but they could use those losses to offset other income that they were earning. And that's, uh, that, that's why, now, when they changed that law in 1986, what do you think happened to a lot of those real estate limited partnerships and investments that didn't make any economic sense? They corrected, didn't they? Yeah, they sure did. Um, along with an oil, uh, change in oil prices, too, that happened around the same time. So there was a big, big correction in the market. And, um, and again, I, I, we're having a little bit of this discussion tonight because with the discussion on tax overhaul, it's going to have an effect on real estate. And as I said, there will be winners and losers uh, that will be as a result of, 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 the, of whatever they ulti ultimately come out with. Okay, question is, what is the ETA for us to finally have a crystallization of whether or not there will be tax 
policy reform that comes to light. Um, you know, the way Congress works these days, I, I, it, it's tough to give you any kind of a deadline. I think they work at the beat of their own drum. Um, but I will tell you that the class that we're doing in October, I think by October, we may have some form of crystallization about what really is in play and what may not be in play. And that's why we're building that into part of the, uh, uh, of the discussion. Because uh, one of the things about tax reform and tax changes, as I said, is there, it's going to affect real estate values and, and maybe even a business that you might own. But um, the beautiful thing is that when there is uncertainty, it creates opportunity, does it not? So it's a good thing. You know, some people say, oh, no, I don't want change. Change is, you know, tough for me to handle, and uh, I don't, you know, want to have that come about. But again, when, when there's changes made, especially a major overhaul in, in our tax policy, again, there'll be some winners and losers. I believe real estate values will be affected. Real estate will have some effect. And you'll see when we get the slides back up some of the areas that I think you need to be concerned about. But uh, the beautiful thing is that that uncertainty creates opportunity in the marketplace if you know how to work those angles. And uh, Peter and John are masters at that. Uh, they're, as I said, they're at a different level and they're able to do that very, very adeptly. And uh, I think there'll be a lot of discussion on that in October when we have them uh, come out and visit with us. Um, so, uh, any other questions on anything we've covered so far about the buckets? I know we had two buckets we showed. Yes. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm Yep. How do you structure your, your, your notes? How do you structure it so you, you get the tail end of it? How would you, how would you position it? If you're buying or if you're selling? No, I'm, I'm, I'm selling, but I want to retain some. Yeah, you're, okay, so you're selling with owner financing. Yeah. And you're going to finance a buyer. And so you want to keep a back end of the loan and sell off the front end of the loan. Um, well, a number of things is that um, the big thing is credit of the borrower. That's the things that we look at. And by the way, we've been investing in paper for 35 years. And we trade in paper, we deal in paper all the time. And you'll see some of the examples tonight about using notes and using creative financing uh, if we can get the slides back up. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to be uh, an, an interesting discussion. But um, uh, in any event, um, inch, we look at credit, we look at down payment, we look at geographic location. Um, the, the stronger the down payment, the better the note's going to be perceived. Um, I would try to get the highest interest rate you can on the note that that borrower can afford to pay and is willing to pay. Um, and I would try to amortize the load a loan over a shorter period of time. The example that was given, I think, was 10 years. That's a great structure, 10, 12 years, which is 120 months to 144 months, fully amortized, no balloon. And then, yeah, you could sell off the front end of that loan and keep what's called the residual or remainder man interest. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the question is, if you are um, selling on a regular basis and extending credit to consumers, and you're providing them financing, you fall under the Dodd Frank requirements and disclosures and and making sure that there's no balloon payments and that you qualify for their ability to repay and uh, so on and so forth. Um, you do have some exemptions under Dodd-Frank. Again, if you're not doing it on a regular basis, you're doing it every once in a while, uh, you should be okay. But if you are doing it on a regular basis, usually more than three or more times in a calendar year, I believe, uh, you're going to then need to jump through some more hoops with the type of disclosures, maybe have an NMLS licensee originate the loan, you know, or do all the application and disclosures so that you're complying with the, uh, with the Dodd-Frank requirements. No balloons that are allowed, no. It has to be amortized. Well, you, you can do 30-year term. You can go, I've seen people go 50 years with no balloon. Just depends on what you're into the property for and what your objective is. But, um, you, yeah, you, you cannot put a balloon payment in there. Um, you can do, I think, a call provision, which is sort of like a balloon, but it's not, uh, uh, what's that? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, you call the loan due, but it, it, it's not required, though. It's sort of at the uh, option of the uh, lender, and that may be a little bit of an exemption. Now, um, the other thing, to, if, for those of you that are wondering, how do I exempt myself from Dodd-Frank, it's very simple. Don't sell to consumers, sell to investors. Or, here's another slick way you can exempt yourself from Dodd-Frank. Let's say I ultimately want to sell to Dylan the property, right? He's a consumer, he wants to buy a house to live in. 
Well, I don't sell to him directly and sell and finance him. I sell to Terriel here, who's an investor, and I finance Terriel. Right? Everybody got that? Now Terriel sells subject to the loan to Dylan. Was there any loan originated? No, only between me and an investor. That's exempt from Dodd-Frank. And then he sold the property subject to the financing to Dylan, who's the ultimate user. So that's just a slick little way of getting around uh, Dodd-Frank and, uh, uh, and, uh, and with, without there being a loan origination. So, you know, again, the government creates these roadblocks. There's a lot of ways that we can play the game uh, to, to, to get around them if we need to. Yeah, okay, everybody understand that? All right, any other questions while we're trying to, I guess, swap out computers? <laughs> okay. All right, no, no worries. Um, so let me, um, let me just talk a little bit more about, uh, uh, about the, uh, uh, the, the, the market also because, as I said, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a concern for me right now. Um, we are and have been preaching now for the last 24 months that we will not get involved in large, protracted renovation projects. Now, some of people may disagree with that, and that's fine, you know. If you want to deal with the city of Mill Valley and wait 16 months to get your plans through and get them approved, that's fine, before you can start swinging a hammer um, and then get into another 12 months or more of construction. I don't know where we're going to be two and a half years from now, um, and I'm not willing to take that risk. So all of the projects about a year and a half ago that we started were pretty much short term, six to eight months in and out. And the reason I like that is because it's like looking out on, if you're on a boat at the horizon, we can kind of see the horizon and we can kind of keep an eye on what's going on on the horizon. I don't know what's after the horizon, if you will, but at least I think it will keep us out of some danger and we can maneuver if we have to over that short period of time. Whereas if you're into a pr project that you bought today and you paid tomorrow's price for, and now you're into a plan check situation with some of these municipalities, it's taking months and months and months before, as I said, you can even do anything. And then you still have to go through the construction phase. Um, you're really, you know, I mean, as somebody once told me about the rehab business, there's a little bit of a gambler spirit involved in the rehab business, you know? And some people like to play with that gambling mentality, but there is a little bit of a gambler spirit that some people are willing to take on. And uh, unfortunately, if this market does change, during that period of time, we've seen many people who simply, they, they're going to lose money at the end of the day or they're just going to bail out and the lender, if there's a lender involved, will end up getting back probably an unfinished property. Uh, so that's a little bit of our take on it. Yeah, Mark. We're wholesaling. We like to wholesale and, and pass the potato to somebody else and let them either buy and keep the property as a long-term rental if they can get financing to make that happen for themselves. We're doing short-term re renovation deals where we can be in and out, as I said, in about six months, plus or minus. And uh, we would love paper deals, too. Paper provides predictable, passive uh, income um, that you can keep uh, capital deployed and keep it working also during these type of uncertain times. Uh, you know, good season loans, well secured, uh, good collateral. Um, so it's a good time actually to be a lender if you're in the lending business because then you're not taking on, you're avoiding a lot of that risk, if you will, of getting involved with the, uh, the protracted long-term project. So um, yeah, that's my take on, 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 on the renovations right now is we're, you know, again, some people may disagree. We see people continue to plot ahead. They want to take on these projects. They see huge paydays at the end of the day. That's, that's fine. Um, I don't want to live that dangerously right now. And, uh, but you know, yeah, there's some money to be made. I mean, if it, if it all works out and the market continues to chug along, you'll probably be okay. But if there's any kind of a hiccup, any kind of a correction, um, beware. And, uh, and you, you know, we've seen a lot of people crash and burn when that happens. They get caught with the wrong time. And often it's not just because of the timing, it's also because they are paying too much at the beginning. Um, we had a gentleman a couple of months ago who um, had the pleasure of getting his offer accepted on a house outside of St. Helena. He called me up because he was about to lose his contract on this house. And uh, I said, oh, really? What happened? He said, well, I can't get the financing. My hard money lender won't make the loan to me. We have a disagreement over the repair cost. And I said, tell me about the deal. He says, well, it's a house in St. Helena. And actually, it wasn't in St. Helena. It was really on the way up the hill to Angwin outside of St. Helena. So that's not St. Helena. 
Um, and then number two, it was a cement block house with the divisible walls being cement block in the house, which is another issue that jumped up at us. And then the other thing was, he was the one that he was gleeful that he got his offer accepted and the asking price that came on the market at 353, he got his offer accepted at 453 and was the successful offer of 18 other offers. Now when he told me this story, what immediately jumped into my mind is, you overpaid for this house. You know, you shouldn't be gleeful. You were the, you know, you thought you were lucky. And in some cases, yes, in multiple offer situations, you can do okay and you can, you can make out. But uh, I think in this case, as it turns out, he, 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 you know, his zeal was so strong to do a deal in the market we're in right now. Because he had been writing offers after offers after offers, getting rejected, getting turned down, that he lost focus on the actual economics of this deal and this property. He was just, it had, he had that, he got caught up in that hype and that fervor, if you will. Okay, let me go back to where we were, if I can. We were talking about the three buckets. We went through the first two buckets. And then the last bucket is portfolio or investment income. This is unearned income. Now, um, portfolio income is generally coming from bonds, CDs, and notes. If you fund a deal with your own personal money and you're receiving interest income, that's portfolio income. It's very taxable. So again, for the first time in 31 years, there's been a discussion about major overhaul of the tax code for both corporations as well as individuals. Here are some of the things that are being discussed that may be in play. First thing is, we're talking about going from seven brackets to three brackets. That's supposed to provide some level of simplification. Is three better than seven? In terms of, uh, in terms of eliminating, some people saying no. Uh, I tell you, your accountant is probably saying no. Um, but th I, ultimately, that is the goal, is to try to simplify and go to three brackets. There's discussion about lowering the corporate tax rates to 15%, may not quite get that low, probably 20 is going to ultimately be what it is, and closing loopholes. Now, the United States has among the highest corporate tax rates in the industrialized world of other nations. So we're way up there, we're not competitive, and that's why there's a lot of discussion on lowering the tax rates for corporations. There's a lot of discussion about eliminating 1031 tax-free exchange. Matter of fact, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal last week on this, right now, on this, uh, this discussion about them eliminating the ability to do 1031 tax-deferred exchanging. And that could also, again, have an impact on property. If you're forced to sell a highly appreciated property and pay tax rather than be able to exchange, um, maybe you won't sell or maybe you'll have to think of a different way to sell or, or move out of that property. No, I don't think it'll have an immediate impact, but I do think it will have an impact. Yes. Um, there's also discussion about 1021 being eliminated. Does everybody understand what 1021 is? Well, let me help you out. If you live in a house two out of the last five years, and you have a, a quarter million dollar gain and you're single, that is exempt from capital gains tax. If you're married, you have up to a $500,000 gain that's exempt. There's discussion of eliminating that 1021 also. That again, I believe will have a big impact on real estate values. There's also talk about eliminating mortgage interest deductions. Okay, this is definitely on the chopping block. There's been a lot of discussion already in Congress about this. Why people are able, able to deduct interest that they pay on their mortgages. What it encourages is people to pay more, to buy more and more an expensive home because they're getting more deductions depending on what kind of income they're earning. So there's a lot of discussion about eliminating that ability to deduct mortgage interest deductions. And then finally, there's, and there's a lot of others, but we're just hitting some of the high points. There's discussion about limiting deductions for both corporate and individual taxpayers. The big thing, in my opinion, is the ability to write off your state taxes against your federal taxes right now. That is, there's discussion about closing that loophole or deduction and eliminating that. Now, if you're in a high tax state, and let's look at some of those high tax states. New York, New Jersey, we're in one here, folks. We're actually the highest. Uh, California, Taxachusetts, okay? Um, if you can't deduct, if you can't deduct the tax against your federal tax, do you think people are going to wake up and say, wait a minute, what are we paying all these taxes for? 
You think there might be some pushback against the elected officials? I can tell you there probably will be. And you know, ultimately what I think the result will be is what I say is people will vote with their feet. They will move to Wyoming, they'll move to Texas, they'll move to Florida. These are states that don't have any state income taxes. And they are more favorable business climate-wise as well. So this, again, I think will have a major impact on values as well in high-cost, high-tax states. And we're in one of them right now. So what do all of these activities that I'm going to share with you, I have a question for you, have in common? Buying and selling property short-term, owning rentals and deriving income from rentals and then selling, earning interest income on loans and notes, or getting paid a paycheck and getting a W-2 type income. What do all these activities have in common with one another? They're all highly taxable activities. Remember, folks, your partner, and I use this term very loosely, um, Uncle Sugar, as we call him, uh, has a very voracious appetite. Uh, it's never ending, actually to collect more and more and confiscate more and more from you. On average, most folks will pay about a third of their earned income over their lifetime in taxes. Now, isn't it make sense to take a proactive approach to somehow minimize and control how much you legally have to pay? Think about it. If you could eliminate a 33% your partner, if you will, taking out of your pocket over a period of five years, maybe 10 years, 15 years, would that be a huge benefit to you? I submit to you it would be. As a matter of fact, it's a huge benefit to you building capital that ultimately you get to use rather than our government. And we all know how efficient our government is at using capital. So remember, the IRS is a tax creature and you must always abide by the IRS laws. We're not talking about doing anything nefarious here or wrong or illegal, okay? But as George Yida, he's a uh, CPA, says, you should learn to use the IRS rules against them. That's what they're there for, okay? To be able to exploit, to be able to work the angles. That's, again, part of that class that we're having in October also. So, sadly, Americans financially, about 95% of our population will reach the age of 65 and they'll still be dependent on work, savings, or God forbid the government. And this is a true statistic. It, and again, I'm not, uh, uh, you know, hopefully nobody in this room is going to be in that boat, but the fact is much of our population does not have investments working for them, does not have savings, does not know how to, uh, if you will, build capital so the capital can work for them as well. So your action step, of course, is to learn and earn. That's what we're having sort of this discussion tonight. My good friend Peter Fortunato says that commerce gets done when people get more in return for what they are giving up, or at least they perceive they get more. So what he's saying is, is that a transaction usually will get done between two parties if each party feels that what they're getting in return is acceptable to what they're giving up. That's commerce in a nutshell, if you will. You need to understand the important difference between assets that produce income and you producing income, right? There's a huge difference between assets or owning assets that produce income, notes, real estate, versus you producing income. And again, what we're talking about is really wages or, or employment type income. Work is the most inefficient way to produce income because it is highly taxable. It's not the most efficient way to produce income. So um, what this is a lead into is I believe everybody should have a retirement account set up for themselves. As, first of all, who has an IRA account self-directed in this room? Good. Okay, I've talked to a few groups and some of them don't even raise their hands. If you don't have one, open one tomorrow. Take advantage of one of these benefits that are offered to us right now. Okay, make sure it is a true self-directed account. But again, the other question that comes up is there's, all, there's a whole variety of them. There's the 401ks and the solo Ks, the traditional and the Roth. I like to stick with just the traditional and the Roth. And the question I always get asked is, you know, which is better for me? Well, the, I would suggest to you, you need to decide 
Do you want to pay taxes on the seed that's going in, or do you want to pay it later on the harvest? Okay, that's pretty much the difference between a Roth and, a, and I mean, a traditional and, a, and an IRA, uh, Roth IRA. So, in order to have an IRA, though, you must have earned income. I have a good friend of mine. He doesn't earn any income uh, that he is considered earned income from the IRS because all he collects is rents, and rents are not considered earned income. It's all he, that's his whole income, it's all is from rents. He doesn't have any earned income. And so we had to figure out a way, how can we get this guy uh, set up an um, uh, a, a IRA account? Because he has to have some earned income. So what we ended up doing is, I had him become a trustee on one of my properties, and I paid him a fee. Now he had earned income. Now he can make a contribution and establish an IRA account. Okay, so there's, there's ways again to, 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 to get around the rules, if you will, if you understand the game. One big myth about high income wage earners is this, and there's a lot of people that we talk to, they're in the Silicon Valley, they're elsewhere, they're making big dollars each year from their income from their jobs, is that I can't have a Roth IRA, I can't contribute to a Roth IRA because I earn too much money. There are contribution limitations in order to be able to contribute to a Roth IRA. Now, I think it's about 198, we have a slide up here in a moment on that. If you earn more than 198 a year uh, as, a single, as a married couple, you may not be able to contribute to an IRA. But uh, I'm going to go through this very quickly. These are some differences between Roth and traditional. Uh, here you go. Um, this is a summary of some of the differences, again, between Roth and IRAs. And uh, this is actually not a current slide, but this one I think is. For 2017, you have phase-outs starting at 184000 and, from, uh, and you're ineligible at 194. So if you're earning more than 194 a year of, of earned income, you may not be able to contribute to a Roth IRA. So the question is, how can I establish a Roth if I'm in this boat? Well, there's a technique to do that. We call it a backdoor technique. Anybody with earned income can actually contribute to a traditional IRA. There's no limitation. You can earn a million dollars a year in income. You can still have a traditional IRA. So what you do, and there's also no income limitations on conversions. So what you do is this. Step one, you make your $6,500 contribution to your traditional IRA, and then immediately, the next day or within the next week, you convert the traditional, pay the tax, to a Roth and contribute to the Roth. It's a rollover. Now you have a Roth IRA, even if you're earning more than $198,000 a year. So that's just a way around again in the system for you to be able to get a Roth established if you're in that boat and you're a high income earner. So here's a tip, and this is very, very important. It's not the contributions that make the difference. It's the growth of the capital in your IRA and getting that initial seed capital in and having it work for you to grow for that future golden harvest. And we're going to give you some examples of things you can do. So many people get hung up on, well, I can only contribute $6,000 a year, and that's not a whole lot of money. But they're missing the point. Get the seed capital in and then grow the account. Peter Fortunato started his IRA account with $2,000. That's the only contribution he made. Within five years, he grew that to $500,000 in capital without any further contributions. You'll have to ask him how he did it or come to one of his classes, but he's pretty sharp at what he does. So it's working the account that makes the, the matters the most, not the contribution. So here's an example of how you can work an account. You have a financial friend who loans, your IRA loans a financial friend $20,000 Okay, your IRA loans your financial friend $20,000 at 12% to be paid in interest-only installments of $150 a month. And it includes a no prepayment penalty clause. What's a no pre, what's a prepayment penalty? If you pay the loan off early over five years, you, you pay a penalty, right? So in this case, this $20,000 loan that I loaned to Terry L, so Terry, you're gonna pay me $20,000 at 12% $150 a month, but you can't pay me off early. If you do, I'm going to charge you a prepayment penalty. Why would I do that? And I'll show you why. Here's the clause. 
The principal of this note may not be prepaid, either in whole or in part, during a period from the date of this note to and including August 2019, and if prepaid, all uncollected payments shall become due. Let me repeat that. All uncollected payments shall become due. So, does anybody know what one of these is? I mean, maybe I should rephrase that question. Does anybody know how to use it? Okay, okay. We focus primarily on the five financial keys. If you don't know how to use the calculator, we teach a calculator class every couple of years. It's a good class, and uh, we'll teach you how to use it. And you should know how to use a financial calculator. There you go. All right. You sign up first, then. Okay. Anyway, those are the keys that we focus on mainly, but you should learn how to use a financial calculator and do what we call present value analysis. So, for those of you familiar with the calculator, these are the columns that we're talking about, and the number of months, the interest rate, the present value, the payment, the future value. This is a characterization of this note. It's a 60-month note, right, five years, at 12%. It's a $20,000 note. The payment is $150 a month, and at the end of five years, the principal is paid back, which is $20,000, because it's interest only. Do we all see that? So we talked about the loan to Terriel being made with the prepayment penalty. After 12 months, how many months are there left to collect on this 60-month note? 48, right? 60-month note, 12 months have been paid, there's only 48 left. What's $150 a month times the remaining 48 months equal? The answer is right there for you. Total $7,200, right? What is that language? Remember that clause we put in the note that he signed? He says that if he pays the note off early, he's going to pay all uncollected interest. So, after 12 months, Terriel pays off my loan that my IRA made him. I got the $20,000 loan at $150 a month. I collected 12 payments. And then at the end of 12 months, he paid back the $20,000 plus all the uncollected interest of $7,200. After 12 months, look at my yield on that little $20,000 note. Is that pretty good? Not bad. Okay? You can do that with people who understand how to play the game and are your financial allies or financial friends. So your goal is to really accumulate enough assets so one day that your income uh, will be replaced by those assets. Your assets will produce the income versus you because as we said earlier, it's far more efficient to earn income from your investments uh, versus earning them from your wages because they are taxed far more favorably. In that little deal we just gave you an example of where the IRA funded the loan, all of that interest income collected was funded by an IRA. Was there any tax due on the collection of that $7,200 plus the 12 payments? No. It's deferred. It was done by an IRA. So it's a wonderful vehicle to be doing these kind of transactions. Okay, let me ask you another question. What does OPM stand for? You guys are really good, I'll tell you. You read a few books, apparently. Okay. So leveraging is not just using other people's money it's using other people's, uh, not just, uh, leveraging is not just using other people's capital or other people's money. It's using often other things that they possess, what I like to call skill sets. It might be where you can use their assets. You can encumber one of their assets so you can borrow money. It might be where you use their credit so they can qualify for a loan because you can't because you don't qualify or you're self-employed or as we like to joke, unemployable by others. Um, it's using maybe their contacts. Maybe they have good contacts. That's leveraging their skill sets and their network, or their time, or other skill sets that they may possess. So the whole point of this is that you need to recruit allies and leverage their ability because they can help you in this endeavor, if you will. Again, uh, Peter likes to talk about this slogan of how he goes into neighborhoods and just talks to people at garage sales and otherwise. He says, you know, hi, I'm looking for a house in this neighborhood. Could you please call me if your neighbor, could, or, you know, he says, please call me or have your neighbor call me if anyone has an excess house for sale. And he leaves them a scribbled piece of paper with his phone number on it. That's planting seeds to try to get phone calls. Is that a good technique to try to do in this kind of market right now where, or would you rather continue to bang your head against the wall and deal with MLS properties that are listed? <laughs> Okay, you want to get the off-market deals, especially in the market we're in right now. 
So this is a great technique, again, to plant those seeds. And people will call. Sometimes they'll call a year later. You know, so-and-so's going through a divorce. They want to sell. I gave them your number. He gets calls on these things, but it's priming that pump. And it's talking to people and walking in the neighborhoods and the streets, which most people do not want to do. Because there's a lot of rejection involved. So you want to enlist allies and ask for their help. People can do business with one another and they can help each other out. So here's one question you can ask most people, and that is, do you pay taxes? What do you think the answer is going to be for most folks if you ask them that question? Yeah. yeah. So let's say that you're trying to borrow $100,000 from somebody, and if they chose to lend you that money as an individual at 12% interest, that's $12,000 a year that they will collect, right, on the $100,000. But if they did that loan personally to you with their own personal funds, is that really $12,000 of interest net to them? No. Why? We've got taxes involved. And again, we talked about earlier, about 33% of, of that interest is highly taxable. That's portfolio income. Remember that bucket? Portfolio income. So really, after you take the 33% out, what, is it, what are they really collecting in after-tax interest? About $8,000, even though it's a 12% note. So if you can show them how they can set up one of these little IRA accounts we're talking about, and they can get that money or in there somehow and fund that same loan to you, that $100,000 loan to you, at 9% interest instead of 12% interest, is that a good deal for them? How much are they going to earn on $100,000 at 9%? $9,000. Is there any tax involved that they funded out of their IRA? No. Is $9,000 net better to them than $12,000 where they got to pay 33% tax and end up with $8,000? Yes or yes? Yeah. Is that a better deal for you? Yes. Because you're not paying 12, you're paying 9. So it's a better deal for both parties to pay to, to show them how they can benefit and how you can benefit as well. Now, we hear this all the time about, you know, well, I have an IRA, but my money's sitting with a custodian in Ohio or wherever it may be in New Jersey, and I can't move quickly enough to tie up this deal that I just found out on the street. Well, here's a little technique. You find a great deal. The property would be perfect for your IRA. You know it will be gone quickly and act, you have to act fast, but you don't have the ability to put earnest money up because you want to buy the property in your IRA. Can you write a personal check and tie up the deal and then try to finagle the paperwork later on in the IRA? No. That's a prohibitive transaction. It may very well taint your IRA. You certainly don't want to do that. So what you can do is you can go ahead and call a financial friend. Hey, Terriel, I got this property over in Vallejo. It's a great deal. My IRA wants to buy it. Will you go out and put it under contract with your name on it and make sure the contract is assignable? And then I'll pay you $100 to simply then assign the contract to my IRA while I deal with the paperwork with the folks back in Ohio that takes five days for them to get their paperwork together. Can he do that? Sure. And that's, again, working with financial friends, working with individuals to game the system. He goes out, he gets it under contract right away, puts the earnest money down. He then assigns that to my IRA. My IRA pays him a small finder's fee for his service and his trouble. Everyone benefits, and now we can move quickly, even though the money is and the paperwork can't be done for four or five days because it's with a custodian. So another quick situation, um, buying at a discount but no cash flow. Here's the situation. You own a nice, well-located rental home, uh, valued at about $300,000. You still owe $180,000 of debt against the home, but it has a bad loan on the property at 8%. The payments on that loan are $1,700 a month, and the home will only rent for $1,800 a month. Is there a lot of cash flow in this deal? No. I, I, I submit to you that owning a rental house like this with a bad loan on it that doesn't have any cash flow, it gets old pretty quickly. Okay, there's very little cash flow here. So here's a possible solution. You know somebody who has money that is sitting in their account in an IRA that is earning nothing for them right now. They're itching to get it deployed. 
They have about $180,000 in cash to invest. You offer to sell them a 70% interest in this rental home if they'll free and clear and pay off the $180,000 of debt. Why would they do that? Well, first of all, they can deploy their money. They're going to own a 70% interest in a house that's got some equity in it also, right? The house is worth 300, the debt is only 180. And now the home has no longer any debt against it. So it's free and clear. It has effectively been definanced. Okay? There's no debt on this house anymore. It's definanced. What has happened to the cash flow now on this house? Before it was earning nothing, now what's happened? When you pay off debt on a house and now you're still collecting $1,700 a month in rent, is that a better thing than $100 a month? Absolutely it is. So now you've, got, you've improved your cash flow. You're getting 30% of the rent, which is 540. That's 30% versus $100. So that's a good deal for you. And you still have part of the upside. You still have 30% of the ownership interest in the property. And the IRA investor gets 70% interest or, or $210,000 that they have acquired for $180,000. So they've, acqu they've acquired a little bit of a discount in the equity in the property. And they're getting $1,260 a month, which is 70% of the rent in cash flow, or about $15,120 a year. That's about an 8% return to them. And that's a good return, as we were talking about earlier, you know, for somebody. Plus, they have the potential for appreciation in the property. Now, what is the potential downside in this transaction? Is there a better way to do it? Anybody? I'm not a big fan of owning rental real estate in an IRA. Why might I not be a big fan of putting rental real estate in my IRA? Yeah, that's one reason. Have you ever heard of a slip and fall? or somebody cutting their hand maybe on a saw or something like that happening on a property. Um, why would you put an asset into an IRA that does provide tax benefits, as Bo said, that you don't get any benefit of it anymore? And that's when you own real estate in the IRA. You're negating the tax benefits that the government is giving to us. So rather than have the IRA purchase the 70% interest in the property, Here's another way to do this deal, which I think is a better way to do it. Have the IRA make a $180,000 loan against the property with a shared appreciation component to the loan. Now the tax benefits are still with who? With the owner of the real estate. They get the benefit of the tax benefits, the depreciation, the write-offs, et cetera, et cetera. The IRA now is just a lender, and I would arguably say that being a lender is safer than actually owning the real estate itself in the IRA account. Okay, <clears throat> and the, uh, because of the shared appreciation component to the note, the IRA can benefit also from any future sale or appreciation of the property. So we've basically done a very similar thing, we just structured it a little bit of a different way. Yes? You want my intellectual property. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, sure. There you go. That's a good idea. That's a good, that's a good uh, uh, cliffhanger. Yeah. Okay. So it's a beautiful scenario. I think we're get, we have a few more slides to go. You buy a property, you fix it, you renovate it, you resell it, you make a huge profit, and to top it off, you don't pay a tax, bunch of taxes because you did the transaction through your IRA. It's a brilliant strategy. Realty Track reports that the average profit on flipping nationwide is over about $73,000 this past year. It's a lot more here in the Bay Area, I can tell you that. But this is nationally. Is this a great idea or not? I don't like flipping properties generally within the IRA or doing it frequently, and I'll tell you why. Because it starts to look more and more like you're running a business. And if you're running a business in your IRA, you then have other things that come creeping into the situation, like UBIT, Unrelated Business Income Tax, which also is very punitive, if you will. And I don't think that's a good thing to do. So will we occasionally buy a property, renovate it, and sell it through our IRA? Absolutely. We will not do it on an ongoing, regular basis, though. 
because we're concerned that then we could be cast as being in business with the, that the IRA is really in business and therefore it may be subject to other type of taxes. So here's a situation. You acquire a fixer upper here in the Bay Area for $700,000. Now we're into some Bay Area numbers, okay? $700,000, you invest $100,000 into the renovations. You then sell that property for $1 million. What is your gross profit on this deal? Your gross profit. Anybody? 200. You guys are good. What's the problem with that gross profit? Yeah, Uncle Sam is going to reach his hand in your pocket. It's highly taxable activity, right? So, long-term individual capital gains bracket. Now, this is a little dated. This is from 2014. If you're earning over $400,000 a year, and we know folks that are earning that or more, okay, they are, um, they're paying, they're at a tax bracket almost pushing 40%. And by the way, this is just federal. This doesn't include the Golden State taxes. Okay, this is just federal. Okay. So, let's look at a different structure to minimizing taxes when flipping. And this isn't going to, I want to preface this and let you know that this isn't going to work in every case. Okay, this is not a magical bullet that you can put in your gun and shoot and every time it's going to work. But in certain cases it can work and it's a very creative structure. So, here's the situation. You find a private seller who has owned, owned a house which has an after repaired value of a million dollars or more. It can be purchased as a fixer upper for $700,000 cash, almost identical to what we just talked about. It will require $100,000 in renovations to improve and enhance its value and turn it and transform it from an ugly duckling into a beautiful swan. Does everybody understand the transaction? Okay. If you buy and sell at home, as we said earlier, you'll be taxed highly taxed at ordinary income taxes on the short-term gain. So that's not, you don't earn 200,000, you earn 200,000 minus a significant amount of taxes um, on that gain. But what if you didn't buy the house and you actually did the deal a different way? You negotiated to have your financial friend buy the house instead of you directly from the sellers where you could structure the deal so that they, the sellers, would still get the $700,000 cash that they are seeking. Let's look at that. Now in this particular example I'm going to share with you, we're talking about a probate house that heirs inherited. They don't want the house. They know they can sell it. They know that they don't really care too much about the tax structure on it because they have a stepped up basis in the property when they inherited it and they want to just basically move it and get their cash out of it, however, as long as they get their money. So here's a different way to structure virtually the same transaction we just talked about, which is highly taxable in a different manner. You have your financial friend agree to pay the property sellers $900,000 for the house if they will finance the sale via a purchase money deed of trust or mortgage and promissory note. So what are we doing? We're changing this from a cash purchase to a seller financed purchase, but there's another component to this. I know you guys are probably saying, well, wait a minute, they want cash, they really don't want to do this, they just want cash. Okay, all right, fine. How do you secure or would you secure that $900,000 note against that property through the, what we call the magical ceremony of escrow? How would you secure that note? with a deed of trust, which is a security instrument. And then there'd be a note for the 900000 okay? Are you with me so far? So, now you have your financial friend purchase the home for 900000 and you arrange in the same escrow to put $700,000 in that escrow to buy that $900,000 note right in the same escrow all through that escrow, okay? So what are we doing here? Now, I can tell you a lot of sellers may push back and they say, well, I don't want to carry a note back. I don't want to hold a $900,000 note. But do you think if you could show them that this is really just a two-step process that we're taking here? You're only going to hold the note through escrow for about, an, uh, about 20 minutes. 
I'm going to have 700,000 put into that same escrow that'll be sitting there. And once you take the note back, you'll just simply sell it and you'll get $700,000 cash, which is ultimately what you want. Do you think that might alleviate some of the pushback? Yeah, it won't work in every case, but in many cases it will. So let me ask you a few questions. I want to make sure that you guys have been paying attention here. Who owns the house if you do this deal? Your financial friend. What do they get through that escrow that shows their ownership in the house? They get a deed. Who owns the debt against the house? Your IRA. How did your IRA acquire that debt? They had an assignment take place of the deed of trust from the sellers to your IRA, right? That's how the IRA acquired the $900,000 note. How much debt is owed to your IRA in this transaction right now? I hear 700, I had somebody say 900. It is 900,000, that's what the note is for, right? What's missing here? No, this is a fixer upper house. How are we gonna fix this house? What's missing? How much is it going to cost to fix the house? $100,000. Where are we going to get the $100,000 to fix the house? Right? We need to renovate this house. Or I should say our financial friend needs to renovate this house. Can your IRA advance an additional $100,000 to your financial friend to do the renovations? Yes. Of course they can. Right? Now that money is available to do the renovations. So now I want to see if you've been paying attention thus far. How much total debt now is owed against this house? There's a note for 900000 and there was an advance for 100000 to do the renovations. Bo said $1 million dollars. Is he correct? Yeah, he is. $1 million. Bo, you're good at math. That's right. So let's look at what happens now. Your financial friend does the renovations, transforms the home from an ugly duckling to a beautiful swan. House gets renovated, put, put on the market through an agent, gets listed and gets sold at a million seventy-five thousand dollars. There's a commission involved to do that sale. That's about 5%. That's $53,000 that comes off the top. The balance due to the seller, your financial friend is a million twenty-one thousand two hundred fifty dollars they're not very good at doing renovations, are they? They didn't really make a lot of money here, did they? But is there a lot of tax due on that $21,000? Is there tax due, first of all? Yes, but it's only on $21,000. So your financial friend did make something for helping you put this together and for their trouble, right? They did the ownership interest in the property, they orchestrated the renovations, they sold the property, and they got $21,000 that's taxable for their trouble for doing all of that. Now, where did the million dollars go? To the IRA, right? The note was 900,000, and there was 100,000 that was advanced for additional renovation money, so the million dollars went to the IRA. Is there any tax due on that million dollar gain? Is that a better way to possibly do business which sucks out the taxation of the transaction where the IRA benefits, it's now in a safe harbor that is a non-taxable vehicle, or would you rather write a check to pay taxes out of that $200,000 gain? And your financial friend benefits as well a little bit along the way. So all we did is we took essentially the same structure, the same deal, bought it for seven, sold it for a million, we tweaked it a little bit, and we put it together with a few other components in order to take the taxation out of the transaction. Now, a common makeup of your IRA's assets, generally for most people, are loans or notes. Okay, we fund a lot of notes out of our IRA. They provide the income or the cash flow to your account, but recognize that earning yield is not enough to grow that account. If you can earn 8% or 12%, that's great, but it's not gonna dramatically grow the account unless it's over a long period of time. So how do you provide the kickers, the horsepower, if you will, 
to really try to ratchet up that account like Peter did to get his 2,000 to go to 500,000 in five years by using other things like options or shared appreciation notes or other techniques that are available to you in order to really ratchet up that money. Remember we said the seed capital is the most important thing, not the, um, is, is not the contributions. It's that seed capital, getting that initial money into that account and learning how to work it. The typical makeup for most IRA investments is generally this, is the income is derived from notes or loans, the growth really comes from the options or shared appreciation notes, and then you've got liquidity or cash sitting around waiting to be deployed for the next investment. That's the common makeup for most people's IRA accounts or retirement accounts, um, is, the, is the, what we see and generally what we do as well. So again, I want to share with you this class that is coming up uh, in October, October 21st, 22nd. Uh, if you like some of this stuff, these guys take it to another level. It's well worth your time to be there, as we said. Um, again, that's going to be the way to register, and I think there's some things that you're giving out as well here. I want to leave you with this thought from John Paul II. He talks about the future begins today, not tomorrow. Okay, remember we talked about taking action. And I want to thank you guys for having me tonight. I hope you got something out of the presentation. Thank you. All right, that was awesome. This makes me want to do some deals. But anyway, so uh, if you want, guys want the slideshow, I'm going to send out an email with the link to the event. I know it's going to be good, so I'm going. Uh, just so sign up. Oh, I'll send it to them. They'll click on it. It's fine. Um, anybody have any haves, wants, or needs? We usually do that too, and I, we didn't do it today. Anybody have any haves, wants, or needs? Okay, here's a question. So, Mike, you, you talk about putting all this money into the IRA, but, and tax-free, but eventually it's going to be taxed. No, it's a Roth. No, it's a Roth. Uh, Roth, Roth, or uh, you, you pay tax going in. You pay taxes overseas, uh, and, you don't, not, and you get to generationally go another generation and roll over that account. So even if you die, there's no tax deal on your demise. They can go for another generation with your benefit. Except you say, I'm. Um, but, but the regular IRA, once you start taking the, the money? It requires distributions at a certain age, yes. And then you're taxed. And then you're taxed. And that's, a, that's why I don't like the traditional in many cases. Uh, Thank you. It requires distributions. Um, one other comment also about the. Uh, Mike? Yeah, Mike. Yeah. Oh, Mike. Oh, Mike. Oh, Mike. 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 Got it. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I go by Michael, but okay. Uh, okay. Um, one other comment about the IRA um, is that, um, uh, as I said earlier, get that Roth established, get that seed capital in there, you can do some dramatic things with it. But you got to get that seed capital in, and you got to learn ways to grow it. We gave you a few examples tonight of how you can work with one another and ratchet that money up pretty quickly. Um, and there's a few other things, too, that we obviously, because of time constraints, can't share tonight, though. Yes, so everybody make some financial friends today. I know I have a few financial friends in here, so it's always good. That's what these, uh, so the rest of the evening, just uh, network and have drinks, foods, tip your uh, bartenders and uh, cocktail waitresses. Um, anybody have any house wants, needs? Next month, I believe David Green is going to be our speaker. Yes. And, and David, David's got a good story because um, uh, just how he analyzes out-of-state properties and just makes quick decisions on buying them. He doesn't borrow money from other people. He just so he has an interesting model. So I think um, uh, he's been buying a lot in Jacksonville. Uh, he owns the majority of his homes there. I think he's got 35 or so rentals. What do you have? 35, 40 rentals. He buys a couple every every month. It seems. He's got three in contract now, right? And then uh, uh, he was a full-time police officer and still manages to be the number one top real estate agent at Keller Williams. I don't know how he does it, but anyways. <laughs> anyway, so he probably doesn't have to be a run law enforcement for too much longer, but that's, that's a pretty good story. So, and he's um, only 34, I think, so not, not too shabby. So we'll have him um, if he's available. Uh, present on his model on how he's how he's making his 
his uh, investment decisions out of state and how he's borrowing money and re um, refinancing and um, he's able to do that on a, on a scaled basis and so it'll be good so we'll, we'll pick the date it'll be here um, upstairs at 1515 and then July 22nd which is a Saturday uh, if we get enough signups who wants to go so, uh, to the note school the one-day event raise your hand yeah we can we can actually play the video okay we're gonna provide lunch it's gonna be like 40 or 50 bucks um, Tom you might be able to film it too I don't know they probably won't don't want you to film it actually um, so anyways I'm gonna go to that and then October we're gonna go to Michael's event not Mike Michael and that's gonna be a, a killer event so so I think after those two events and then David Green I mean everybody should be ready to take some major action Anyways, thanks for coming, and I will talk to you. Okay. He's pretty much uh, he's offered me some really good returns, so I'm going to actually want to get with someone in the group about putting some notes together. Um, it's a really big deal. Uh, he's busy. Uh, we're, I'm actually going to be probably flying back uh, back east in the next five, seven days to spend maybe two weeks there. Then I got a development project in uh, Oakland. It's a house personally for myself. I might want to partner up with someone. I'm going to be injecting a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of cash personal. But uh, I might want to share that with someone, pay someone some interest. And then also, I've got a uh, another lot that I'm looking at. So if I can do two of these homes, we can pretty much maybe um, have one sold uh, before done. And Oakland, Oakland Hills. Um, I'm acquiring them. I got one already. The other one's probably going to grab about 200000 Just pay it off cash. I've already done all the land survey, all the geotechnical. So I already know basically anything can hang on the side of the hill. And it's, I look today, it's pretty good. <laughs> good. <laughs> Almost said it. But it's a pretty good project, man. Uh, you can see from San Jose all the way to San Francisco, uh, there's nine lots. So I'm going to try to just encourage the people to sell them. Because uh, I got an architect, he's designed a 3,500 square foot lot. He's charging me 30 grand to do the design, so I'm beating him there. I'm thinking about $12 a square foot design, um, and it's not going to be, you know, I'm not going to manage it. It's just going to be off my plate. So that's where I'm at. I got a couple of deals. People that want to maybe pull some money together, and right now he's offering me 12% interest return. So I just want to make sure I'm doing that correctly, though, because the taxes, you know, I won't even get involved. <laughs> I won't even get involved. With it. Financial friends, right? Okay. Anybody else have anything? Thanks for coming, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Oh, okay. Hold on. My name. My name is Rich, and I'm with STS Investors, and my email is rich at s t s i n v e s t o r s dot com. So you can see me an email that way. I want to say one thing. Thank you to this guy. I just bought a half million dollar building from him. All right. All right. Okay. I think we're good. So till next month, David Green. Are you going to do PowerPoint for us too? No, I've never done one. <laughs> Can I get a feel for the room? Is there anyone in here, if you don't mind telling me, that doesn't know how to analyze a property, like, really confident? Like, is there anyone in here who, if I said, hey, would this place cash flow or not, that wouldn't really know where to start? I think you should put that out. There's, a, there's some newbies here. So just start with that. Like, hey, this is what I'm looking for. You know, and then, I mean, it doesn't have to be too in depth, but enough where somebody that's new, and then get into the meat and gravy. Um, that you know, some of us more experienced guys want to see, and then also this, uh, we'd like to know where you're buying <laughs> exactly the street, the, the streets. Okay, but you get the point. Anyways, all right, let's get networking. Build some financial friends. I got uh, t tabs on you right now. <laughs>